Well, the more we use apps and, and internet, uh, the more we can work cross borders and take advantage of each other's findings. Uh, now, our next speaker has experiences for both blended treatment and hybrid treatment, uh, where both the internet and the physical treatment are combined. Also working in projects over borders of countries. Now, please welcome Dr. Gerard Andersson from Linköping University here in Sweden. Welcome, Gerard. Thanks a lot for that, and uh, it's great to follow now these excellent two speakers, and I will do my best to be uh, short and focused. Right, and you see the main conclusion here, psychological internet treatments work and can be exported to other cultures and languages. My starting point here was actually the pandemic. We wrote a little piece about this. You know, these things have really, really changed in terms of attitudes towards digital solutions. And I've, for, for a long time, I said this is a complement and sometimes a replacement. For some people now, through these last one and a half years, it's been the only way to access any form of mental health care. So that's an important thing, important background. What I would like to do now is to tell you a little bit what this is and something about the evidence. I will give you examples of adapted and translated work and some conclusions perhaps about the, this so-called gap. Internet treatment, what I'm referring to here, uh, for those of you who don't know already, we nowadays, given broadband access, we can use text and films. It very much resembles online education. So if you've ever done any online course, you would recognize yourself in many of these systems. Indeed, you can transfer them to apps and tablets, but in the end of the day, actually several people who have worked with these systems prefer to sit in front of a sort of a larger screen. So apps are not only abundant, but not so popular as you would have expected. As already said by Paul, you know, most of the evidence is for the guided interventions where you have a clinician behind the scenes who give you support when you need it, or even on a scheduled basis. And this support can be done fairly easy, by the way. It's been shown that less skilled practitioners can do it as long as they have supervision. And in terms of research support, there are so many tasks in, in clinical trials that take enormous amount of time. Usually those tasks are quicker when you do this online, which means that I'm I don't know if my colleagues agree with me here, but you know, we, we're approaching the stage when there is more evidence for internet treatments than there is for standard face-to-face -face treatments. Larger trials, more trials. Odd how does this happen? One way to summarize the evidence, and this is only possible in fields that are really established, because then you can do something called umbrella review. It sounds like a song by Rihanna, but it's not. It's a, a way when you have systematic reviews and you can do a review of these systematic reviews. And so we did, and uh, focused on common mental health problems. And um, yeah, the most recent uh, meta-analysis, systematic reviews. And I'm sure not all of you are familiar with this, but most of you are, and I'll tell you what it means. It means that the so-called effect size here is the difference between getting a treatment and not getting a treatment. Uh, usually, if it's about, about 0.80, it's really, really good. So now you know. So for panic disorders, when it comes to internet treatments, it's more than good. Social anxiety disorders, same. Generalized anxiety disorders, the same. A little bit less than, very, than good. For PTSD, even, you know, working with trauma, many of my clinician colleagues, and I'm a clinician myself, would that seriously doubt if that's possible? Well, at least for not too severe problems, this way of working might do the trick. And again, also major depression, which is a huge problem for society. Also pretty good effects. I cannot speak this language. It's the Kurdish dialect or language called Sorani. And it's one of our earliest studies when two students had this idea of why can't we do this in Kurdish? So, so we did. It took us some years to get this published, but this is a very basic story. You have a group of people and you get ethics approval and then you randomize them to getting a treatment or waiting for a little while. 
and then you provide treatment for them afterwards. Sometimes we give them support, sometimes an alternative treatment, but this is a very good starting point. This is better than getting nothing, which is very often the case. You don't get anything else. So uh, here, their depression scores decreased uh, up to six month follow up, whereas not so much happened for the ones who waited, were in the wait list for program. And I would briefly um, touch upon this, uh, but obviously, this is not something I would have been able to do myself. You need to culturally adapt. And these were two Kurdish guys who could do that. They were actually on Kurdish television locally here in Sweden. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, to make it tailored for that group, you know, just such a thing as a word like depression doesn't mean the same thing in different languages and cultures. Another example, this is still Europe, but it's the former Eastern Europe, where there's not been so much research done, for one reason, not having so much resources. And I think this is probably one of the first controlled trials on social anxiety disorders. There was this guy in from Romania who came and visited our lab, and we translated our social anxiety disorder treatment and he worked with a bunch of colleagues and students in Romania. He really didn't believe in this, to be honest. He was kind of skeptical. People will not like, will not like this, but obviously they did. And uh, so uh, we managed to replicate almost exactly what we've been see, what's been seen in other countries in the world, including Switzerland, Australia, Germany, even the UK, large, uh, interesting, unpublished trial, uh, trial on social anxiety disorder that you will see soon, I hope. Right. And we've moved on uh, to Arabic language. That's another example here. Um, that was quite a challenge as well. Uh, 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 not the least, you know, in Sweden here, we have a substantial immigrant population, many of them being refugees with a refugee background. And um, I tend to view it like, even if you might know Swedish a bit, Swedish might, it's not necessarily your emotional language. So at the very least, when these uh, uh, internet treatments or digital treatments, at the very least, you can translate them. You know? And that's uh, our platform we're working on now is uh, exists in so many languages. This is not, not, not my work, this is work from Ireland. And actually, uh, 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 a person who's from South America, the first author, but they started working on this. How should we think when we adapt treatments, in this case for Colombia? Uh, we cannot just translate them immediately. We need to uh, consider these cultural differences, aspects, and so forth. And that's what we're up to right now here. We're working with young immigrant refugees, and, uh, and uh, to give one example. Okay, this was a quick one, but I think that was the instructions. I'm open for questions. There are many things you can say about uh, this idea of um, doing research, uh, helping other people doing research. Uh, I think it's been much easier to share, not only data, that's the last point here, but also treat. Oh, sorry for this. It's blurred here. Uh, uh, also, treatment programs. Back in the days when we used only face-to-face -face treatments, it had you had to go there. You had to train clinicians. They had to be certified. Here we can move much quicker and get data to see how well does this treatment work in another setting. I hope it can help reduce the treatment versus demand gap, but also speed up the process of adapting interventions and, and developing interventions. You know, even if everyone knows what depression is, perhaps, or uh, uh, social anxiety and so forth, but there are many other problems people have. And we've been running trials now on loneliness, for instance. There is not a diagnosis called loneliness disorder, and perhaps we shouldn't have that. I, but there is, that's a problem that people suffer from. Another is self-esteem and, you know, so we're gradually moving towards those and very much look forward to culturally adapt and work in other settings and languages uh, for those concepts as well. Right, 
So I'll end there and uh, look yeah. forward to your questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all your uh, different projects. Um, one question, uh, what would you say is the most important obstacle to overcome uh, in order to, to uh, greater share between countries? You talk about culture and language. What would you say was, is the, the most important obstacle to overcome? In terms of research, it's actually the lack of um, procedures for ethical approval across mm countries you know in theory we could run a study and include people from all the world but that is a tricky thing even within Europe and I know some people have written about this as well you know it's, it's very hard to uh, handle different legal systems mm -hmm. and uh, and I think some of the good things with nowadays is protecting people with GDPR which is for data protection it was one of the questions right and that's very good. But there's also a problem in research if that makes people not even want to touch upon this. The possibility of treat, helping someone from a country in another country. And we've been thinking a lot about this now when we work with immigrants and refugees who might leave the country while being in treatment. Mm. So I hope we can solve that in the future. But that's a, a, a challenge. Mm. I see. I understand. Thank you so much.